Hi, everyone. Good evening from Boston, Massachusetts, and good day wherever you happen to be. I'm glad that you all joined, and I'm excited to talk about this topic. So I'm going to get right to it. But just before I start to share screen, I just want to uh, mention that if at any point during the talk you have a question, something is or something's confusing, you want clarity, please uh, speak up in the chat. Uh, my friend Maria here is going to be monitoring that. So she will uh, let me know if there's a question and don't worry about interrupting because I really would prefer that you get the most out of this. Okay, so uh, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and share screen. And go to presentation mode. All right. So as you know, you've uh, registered for Pivoting Out of Limiting Beliefs for Entrepreneurs. So I'm going to uh, dig right into those things that are holding you back or that you think are holding you back. That's what we want to get to tonight. So um, the first thing I would like you to do, it's kind of my way of taking your temperature a little bit. Think about... Uh, a limiting belief that's big in your brain right now, something that's kind of top of mind. And I would like you to bring that to the forefront and kind of, you can even jot it down or you can just keep it in your thoughts as we go through these slides, because I would love to, to for you to experience kind of a change, you know, maybe how you look at it at the end will be a little different from how you're looking at it. Uh, right now, that that would be the, the greatest gift, right? So um, think about that thing that's kind of sticking in your brain and um, and and keep that in mind as we go through our, our talk. So if you get nothing else out of this tonight, today, limiting beliefs are not facts. It may seem obvious, but it may not, right? Limiting beliefs are fear-based thoughts and fear-based thoughts, like all thoughts, are choices. They're choices that we make consistently every day, all day. Now, how are we gonna kind of approach this tonight? So I'm gonna break it down into three basic modules, if you will. The first is we're gonna talk about the neuroscience of fear-based thoughts, how it all works, our, our wiring as humans. Then we'll move into how we cultivate the inner dialogue, sort of the, our self-concept, how we talk to ourselves, because we do, um, what kind of, you know, runs around in our brain. And then we're going to move into actual, you know, strategies, actionable strategies you can use to pivot out of those limiting beliefs when they, when they pop up. So before we do that. I want to give you 15 seconds on why I do this and 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 where I came from in this in this in, on this path. So I have been a writer for 30 years. So the the power of language, the power of words, um, it, is it is part of my everyday existence. Very resonant with me, and it has been throughout my career. But I have more than 35 years experience with um, crippling limiting beliefs. So um, that's kind of you know most of most of us come to our work right from a personal place, if we're lucky, um, and I certainly did. So about 12 years ago, 12 to 15 years ago, I started to get really curious about sort of these two facets of my career. Why do we do the things we do? Why do we get in our own way as much as we do? Personally, I was curious about why I did. So I started to dig into psychology and neuroscience and try to understand human wiring and, and how it all works, you know, because science evidence, you know, it is, an, is a big part of my work. It's not just my opinions, right? So I wove all of that together and I created change for myself. And at that point, I decided I really wanted to help other people create the same change. So these strategies and, and skills that I'm teaching um, come from all of that research and work that I did with a support system of psychologists and uh, and clinicians and different people who understand kind of human wiring. And that's kind of where I where I came to this work from. Now, if I were to condense all of that down into a, a sort of a few sentences, a few key phrases, what I learned through all that research 
and weaving it together with my experience as a communicator is that the words we hear from our early lives as young people and in our first families impact the words we think. And that is our inner dialogue and how we relate to ourselves and to our thoughts. And that those in turn impact the words we say and that is how we show up in interaction. And all of that impacts the thoughts we choose. And the thoughts we choose include limiting beliefs. So, so that's kind of a, a ba- little backstory to, to get us started. So let's talk a little bit about science, right? The, 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 the nuts and bolts of human wiring and our brains wiring. Now, when people talk about fear and fear-based thoughts, and sometimes they get into the weeds on this kind of fear, and this is not what we're talking about, okay? The tiger in the room, the spider on the wall, the dark alley, that, that triggers and activates the, the pathway of your brain that creates the fight or flight response. That is a, that's a different pathway. That is not the same part of the brain. That originates on either side of your brain stem from the amygdala, which is actually two structures, but we refer to it as the amygdala. And that's where, you know, your neck hair stand up and you're like, okay, I have to get out of the way. And you'll notice that this part of the brain is not in the gray matter. It's not in the big part of the brain. And there's a very good reason for that. If you're standing on a train track and the train is barreling towards you, you are not going to weigh your options as to how many seconds it takes before you get killed, right? You're going to get off the train track. So there's a reason why, neuroscientifically, why we don't think when we're in fight or flight. We don't want to think. If we had, we probably wouldn't have evolved as a species as we had. So we know when there's survival instinct, when there's an immediate threat, we get out of the way. We don't think about it, right? You don't hold your finger on the iron and say, gee, this is starting to hurt. So that's that's based in the amygdala. What we're talking about tonight is this. Can I do it? What if I mess up? What if I make a mistake? Maybe this whole idea is ridiculous. Maybe my, I'm kidding myself. This is all cognition, right? This is happening in the cerebral cortex, in the gray matter, the big part of the brain, right? And that's where our logic center is. That's where our language is. And, and we create these thoughts by choice based on a lot of things, which we'll get into in a minute. But the research into neuroscience in the last decade and a half, two decades has been remarkable in discovering this thing called neuroplasticity. And what does that mean? That means that obviously when we learn something new, like a language, uh, how to drive, how to cook, how to, you know, whatever, a skill, it shifts our brain's wiring. We, we, we adapt, our brain changes. And that makes sense, right? We all kind of accept that. But what research has discovered is that when we think about doing new things, the brain changes also. So think about that. The takeaway is that we can change our experience by changing our thoughts. We change our body and brain's experience by changing our thoughts. And that is a powerful, powerful finding. It's kind of like you have the power, but you don't even realize it, right? Because we're not really good at noticing ourselves. We're just good at believing what we think. So this idea of neuroplasticity applies to limiting beliefs because we can choose differently and then change our experience by choosing differently. Now, is it easy? Does it happen automatically? No. And it may seem a little bit lofty. So I'm going to tell you a quick story to kind of illustrate this whole concept. Um, During our last presidential election, um, I was driving my car and I think I was about to give a talk that night or the night after about neuroplasticity. And I got cut off by a a, a truck that, that sort of swerved over into my lane and cut me off. And the truck was uh, decorated with all sorts of bumper stickers and flags and different things that 
were very, um, were, was leaving no mystery about the, the political leanings of, of the owner of this truck. So I felt a lot of like, I got very reactive when the truck cut me off. Emotions were running high. You know, the country was very polarized. It was a, it was a kind of a prickly time. And I felt myself getting really enraged. Like I felt, you know, the dry mouth, the shaking, like, you know, the things that happen to us physically when we, and I did a little experiment. I said, I'm going to do this talk. I'm going to, I'm going to try this thing. I'm going to see if I can change, change the narrative here. Because in three seconds, I had written an entire story about the, the driver of this truck who I did not even see. And so I wrote a different story. I created a story about that it wasn't the driver wasn't he wasn't even their truck. They borrowed it from a friend because they had a rush to the hospital because they their their friend's child was sick and they were rushing. I created this whole sympathetic story. And what I noticed was that my body changed my nervous system calmed down. All of those things that were happening physically stopped happening. And it was fascinating how much of a shift occurred because I changed my narrative. And so what does that tell us, right? That, what does that reinforce? Thoughts are choices. We automatically create narratives because that's how we are wired. But then we get into trouble when we believe them. And your limiting beliefs are narratives you're creating and believing. But you can, you can, I would say just as easily, but it's not easy. You can choose a different narrative. Reframe the thought. It requires practice and consistency but it absolutely can be done. Um, so, so then how does that sort of segue into our inner dialogue? Well, if you think about it, it's not too big a leap, right? If, if our brains kind of automatically create narratives and we believe those narratives, then we're kind of gonna accept the thoughts that we have at face value. But this is, this is an interesting, um, sort of a little bit of backstory on, on how that inner dialogue gets created. So from the age of negative, like in utero, research is showing, to about seven, eight, or nine years old, the human brain is essentially a tape recorder. And what it does is absorb everything around it and codifies the world that way. So First family modeling, imprinting of, of experiences as a child with family, early school experiences, early, you know, uh, friend experiences. Um, is how that's how we formulate our concept of self. And um, I always am very curious and fascinated by how resistant many of us are to look back at our imprinting because either somehow. We think it's kind of, I don't know, uh, kind of woo-woo, like it's not really reality, like, oh, that was then, this is now. Um, or they feel like they're trying to blame people early in their life for whatever issues they're having. And not, neither of those things are, are, are what we're trying to get at here. What we're trying to get at here is the science of early life is that we are imprinting, everything's getting imprinted in our brain and in our nervous system as young children. To think that as we age, it evaporates out of our nervous system is, is just ignorant. It, it doesn't, it's not based in fact and in, and in science. So how we code experiences early on stay with us deeply rooted in our nervous system as we go out into our world and live our lives. And to kind of give you a little bit of a, contextualize that a little bit for you, because it can be kind of weird to think about that. How does that work really? I created this, um, this graphic, and actually it's a worksheet that I use um, in, in, with students and in, in a course that I created. And you will have access to this at the end of the presentation. Um, there'll be a QR code and you can get it with instructions. 
I, I created this like inner dialogue mapping worksheet to help people kind of connect those dots because it can be a little overwhelming when you think about it, like, well, why am I afraid of public speaking? Why do I have trouble taking up space when I am at work and I want to share an idea? Why do limiting beliefs get me hung up and then I can't get out of my own way? So this worksheet, these road signs here are where I encourage clients and students to put early life experiences that they remember that may have been very impactful and have a lot of energy around them. It, they're usually negative. I mean, because, you know, that's just the way it is. We really remember negative things more. That's how we survive. Um, but same could be true of a positive experience. It can, it can manifest in your, in your behavior as you get older. But these road times are for like early life experiences. For example, um, my, uh, when I was young, I was told I could never be a whatever, a dancer, a doctor, a, um, and, or I tried out for the school play in high school and it was a disaster. And now I have trouble public speaking, right? So the experiences go there. The effects of the experiences go up here in these manifestations, um, um, bases. And what it does is it helps you connect the dots, right? Words we hear, words we think, words we say, limiting beliefs. Oh, it, it, it can be very enlightening to sort of map out your own journey. How did I create the relationship with myself that I did? There's reasons for it. There always are. Um, so, so that's kind of that's kind of how this inner dialogue we talk about gets generated and gets a lot of traction. Because what do we do? We tend to look for reasons to believe what we believe and reinforce it. So I just want to pause for a minute. Marie, is there any questions or is there anything in the chat that you want to bring to my attention? Uh, not so far, Nancy. Okay, good. All right. So now I would like to uh, teach two strategies that you can use to pivot out of, of limiting beliefs when they, when they emerge. And these are strategies that I teach uh, in my online course. The first is fear fact versus fear fiction. And the second is a, a fear to want activity. So let's start with fear fact versus fear fiction. So what I do in this exercise is I actually have uh, students and clients recall uh, an experience that they had that may have been a little contentious or may have been, you know, stuck with them for one reason or another, maybe a workplace exchange, maybe a review from their manager, maybe a, a chat with a friend, whatever it is. But I have them recount the scenario and then make two columns, a fact column and a fiction column. And I, I ask them to list uh, all of the facts. And, and, and all of the fictional narratives. And it, and it can get blurry at first, um, but typically the fiction column is long um, and the fact column isn't. So let's go back to the, the driving, my driving story. I'm going to do this for the driving story, as sort of an example so you can see how this works. In my driving story, when I got cut off by the truck, these were the facts. The truck cut me off. I swerved to avoid it. I said a few bad words. Those are the facts. The fiction is everything else. Everything else. You, you're going to vote for this. You think this. You're this. You're, I mean, and and if, if, if anything, just try to notice yourself the next time you get agitated. And, and notice the story you're creating and how much of it is based on fact. Now, when we, you know, you may have been working for the same boss for 15 years and you know their proclivities. You know that they tend to do this when you do this. And you, you may have, you know, data that tells you there's a likelihood that they're thinking this or somebody's going to do this because of another thing that you may be aware of, but that doesn't make it fact. So we can get into the weeds really quickly when we not only believe the fictional narratives, but then 
behave, act based on the fictional narratives. So I'm gonna, I'd like to do a workplace kind of example here. So this is just a, a, a made up example. When I was discussing a new product idea at a recent meeting with my team, one of my teammates interrupted me and tried to take over the meeting so she could promote her own version of the product. She ended up distracting everyone and the group lost interest in my idea. I never finished my description, which is exactly what my coworker wanted. Okay, this is this is the narrative. And it's reasonable, like you it doesn't, it's not outlandish. Okay, what are the facts? Teammate interrupted me and presented a different idea. Those are the facts. Fiction. She tried to take over the meeting. She distracted the group intentionally. The group lost interest in my idea. Maybe they started looking at their phones because something went viral. You don't know. She didn't want me to present. She planned the whole thing. You see, I mean, it, and this is very typical. So I would encourage you to try this the next time you either have an exchange that maybe left you feeling less than or triggering those limiting beliefs even more, or even it doesn't have to be contentious or negative, but just something where you notice limiting beliefs came up, check yourself on your facts. Because when you stick to the facts, it can help you not behave based on the fiction. And that's what I'm, that's the point I'm trying to make. We can't be, we're human. We're going to do what we're going to do. But if you can raise your awareness about it, be cognizant of it and check yourself, you can keep yourself from then being reactive rather than responsive, saying something based on the narrative. And that can, that's where communication knots develop. And that can create ickiness, you know, in workplace, in home, in home, in personal relationships. Okay, so let's go to the fear to want, which is always a, a big winner because it, it, it always leads to some great aha moments. So in the fear to want activity, I think about that fear-based thought I was asking, the limiting belief I was asking you to conjure up earlier. I asked my clients to, on, on an index card, on the front of the index card, write the fear-based thought or the limiting belief that's, that's sticking in the, their craw. And on the flip side of that card, to reword it into a want, not a wish or a hope, which is different neurologically, a want. And why do I do that? So think about a fear-based thought or a limiting belief. I'm afraid that, whatever, blank. You are right, right away in a negative thought pattern. You are an avoidance-driven, thinking. Defense. You're, you're, you're trying to protect yourself. So you're in a defensive mindset right away rather than an offensive one. And a fixed mindset. It's, it's this or it's, it's, it's going to, this or something bad's going to happen. Fixed mindset. You're not open and in growth. You're expending energy in that victim mindset, right? So you're expending energy in kind of like reinforcing a negative thought pattern. Now let's look at a want. I want to shifts you into purpose and intention right away. Purpose and intention. You're, it's resolute. I want this to happen. Very different neurologically, very different experience for your brain and body. You're off on offense right away rather than defense, which it, you're in growth mindset. You're open to possibility. I want this rather than I'm afraid of this. And you're expending energy to move yourself forward, right? Rather than stagnate or, or, or go backwards. So let's look at an example of this. Um, fear. I'm afraid my business idea will be copied, right? Not unusual for an entrepreneur, right? I'm afraid my business idea will be copied. Well, what's the point? Let's look at the want. I want to create an original idea with a competitive edge. Now, I have people read the cards, both sides of the cards. 
because writing them is one is that use of language is powerful and it helps to reframe. Speaking them lights up both hemispheres of the brain, which is makes the reframing even more effective. And I have them do five to 10, whatever, however many cards it takes. Uh, one client I had uh, showed up at our first session with 25 cards. I mean, it, 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 you know, it doesn't take long, but, but the experience of reading both sides of the card is it can, it can create a lot of enlightenment in, in how you feel it in your body and you, and you notice the difference between these two things. Here, I'm afraid my business, I, you're in victim fixed mindset, you know, like, uh, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't do it. Here, you're like, well, how do I move forward? I want to do this and I'm going to expend my energy to, to move forward. Let's try another one. I'm afraid my team's morale will suffer if their new ideas don't work. Okay, so what's the one? I want to create a culture in which innovation is embraced, whether or not it's always successful. Victim fixed, intentional growth moving forward. This is a powerful exercise and, and it's something that can, you know, remember the, the image of the brain. When you do this a lot, you know, you're firing different neurons on the want than you are in the fear. And when you do it consistently and you practice this, those neural pathways on the want side get stronger, just like when you go to the gym, you know? So this is, this can be a very helpful in sort of training you to pivot out of those limiting beliefs and choose another thought and another neural pathway. So this idea of neuroplasticity is real, it works, and practice makes it possible. The more you do it, it's like anything else that's worth, you know, anything. You, you have to do it consistently. You have to practice. That way you get better at it. Um, so go back to the limiting belief in your brain right now. And if any, if anybody would like to share thought in the chat about if it's feeling differently, or if you can change it into a want, and you might like to share that, I'd love to, to hear it. Maria, let me know if anybody's offering that up. Mm, not for now, but we'll keep you updated. Okay, good. All right. So what are the takeaways from this today? What, what, what would I like you to take from, from all of this? It's a lot of information. I realize Can't that. And it can, yeah. Just um, one um, actually concern is about the global recession all, and all that's bad in the world. I think we have one, um, yeah, one of our uh, attendees that's uh, mentioning that. So the question is, how do I change that into a want? Yes. How do you, the how do you, is, I think the question is because it's, it's, it's when you're trying to be positive, I, I think it's, it's a question of being like realist versus um, addressing the current sta state of things. And as entrepreneurs, especially, um, you know, it's like, you got to be realistic and take into account this, all this is happening. And can I be this ambitious and this um, at this stage in life? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, like there's always, there are always hurdles for entrepreneurs, right? There are always hurdles and, and it choosing, you know, where you expend your energy is not about putting your head in the sand or, you know, ignoring that there's that there's a global recession, ignoring that there's backlash from the pandemic, there's war going on, there's all these things. Yes, yes. This is a, by no means a, a way to uh, an avoidance tactic. Or, and I, this positive thinking is, is, I get a little bristly on that because it's different than positive psychology. Uh, I, my, the strategies we're talking about are not meant to be like, oh, well, let's just think about everything in a nice way, because that's not realistic, of course. And it's, it's also not sustainable, right? So the, this approach is more about shifting your thoughts into what you can do and want to do, rather than what 
you feel is out of your control and holding you back. So let's take the recession as an example. If as an entrepreneur, you are worried about the global economy, whether you, if you're an e-commerce business, whether people are going to buy your products, you know, so all I'm suggesting is what do you want? I want to use strategies to make my business resilient to the recession and then go about finding out ways to do that. It, it shifts you into kind of a, a mindset where you're going to get curious about what you can do to strengthen your business rather than kind of curled up worrying about what's going to happen that's out of your control, right? So anything you, you think of, you know, war, the effect it has on the economy, uh, the Fed, the effect that it has on interest rates and the cost of money and, 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 and. All I'm suggesting is you, you shift your thinking into what, where you want to expend positive energy rather than where you want to try to protect yourself from things that are out of your control. Does that make sense? Yes. Are they answering? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so takeaways, limiting beliefs are choices. Thoughts are choices. And it's, and it's really hard to believe it because we live in our brains and we believe our thoughts all the time. But they are choices and you can, you can choose differently. Neuroplasticity is real. It is evidence-based. There's been a ton of research on it. And so get curious about how you can use this, you know, this ad sort of an adapt adaptive uh, uh, process in the brain, but it's a strong tool, especially for entrepreneurs, right? You, you can change your experience by changing your thoughts. Stick to facts, notice the thought patterns that you're having and notice how they affect you and practice doing it differently because the more you practice, the better you get at it. And you will more, you're more likely to fire those neurons similarly the next time. You know, it, it just it builds on itself. And all of, I boil down all of this to the following. Words in your head, ones that you heard as a child and the ones that you cultivated and the ones that you, you know, create and that they are the playbook for your life. They, they will determine what you do, where you expend your energy, right? The Buddha says it, I'm not making it up, right? So choose carefully where you expend your energy. And that means what thoughts you choose and how much you allow the limiting beliefs to creep in without sort of checking yourself and reframing them. Um, you can, you can uh, here's a code. If you, go, if you go to this short survey, it's just two minutes. You can get access to that worksheet, which will have instructions with it. Um, I encourage you to do that, and um, and and I would love to hear any questions, um, concerns, anything unclear. Just just let let Hi, us know um, in the chat. We're I'm I'm I, I, if you guys prefer speaking uh, and asking question directly to Nancy, just let me know. I'll unmute you. Uh, alternatively, you could put your question in the Q and A box. Um, yeah, please feel. Uh, free to be comfortable to ask whatever you yes, want. If you, ask an, an, if you want to ask an anonymous question, as in you don't want people to know it's you asking, you can also put the question directly. If you go into the webinar chat box, uh, address it directly to Nancy, so she knows that she can at least she can address the topic and she won't name you um, as the person asking. So um, yeah, please go ahead. And um, I'm looking at this awesome. Uh, list, um, you know, the registries, the registrants for the, the webinar. And a lot of these questions, you know, about what they were looking to learn. I'm curious to know if, if, if they learned something, if, if it answered their questions, um, because if it didn't, I would welcome you to ask questions now. I'm happy to, to answer, or you can always feel free to reach out with to me on Wisley or to, to email me um, directly. I know sometimes these, 
these thoughts people aren't anxious to share <laughs> also it's it's quite it's a, it's quite a lot to digest sometimes so people need to really think about uh what is it that you know how it relates to them in their life um yes um, it is but as 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 an entrepreneur myself who's who's been on this journey for um the past year of building wisley um i think one of the the biggest things that got demystified for me today is um is what you said about the difference between positive psychology and the whole uh, using the word want and the way the thought and experience is linked because i mean we all know it's it's tough and you need mental resilience to to um to carry on and 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 day to day really like have focused execution in what you're doing and that comes from within the belief in what you're building yes. doing is something right yes. um and then you do get a lot of woo woo out there with the manifestation stuff almost like okay you know um imagine that you're getting a million dollars and you will or you know uh, uh and 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 it's just there is more of an approach to it in the sense that if you from what i got from you is like is the it, it it's the the power of language the want aspect and also just changing and reframing um things like i if you think that everything is doom and doom and nothing's going to work that's the kind of stuff that's you're going to see every your perception is that then nothing will yeah, right yeah, because and, and, and yeah so, because so, yeah yeah so the perception has to change for the experience to change is what i um and i, yes. I think that that was for me um quite a connect the dot moment when you today yes the ver- exactly right and i didn't want to get too in the weeds on this but you know we we if anybody's ever read the book thinking fast and slow by Kahneman in Kahneman i mean our our ability our, our cognitive biases are are tremendously powerful and we think our thoughts and then we look for evidence to believe them right it's a cognitive bias we all have them and so confirmation bias oh i think this thing and the fed raised rates and there's a war in ukraine and see 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 it's i'm right i'm right i'm right we 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 do this all day every day i mean it's just what we do so and and i'm not saying we we're going to be different but when you raise your awareness about it and you connect those dots to puja's point then you're taking the power back and that's why this little worksheet can be really helpful because i've had people have realizations like oh that's why i do that thing every time i'm in a i'm in a, a team meeting and somebody questions my authority you know oh it's back to aunt ginny at the thanksgiving table or you know whatever so it's just it can be really powerful to just do that digging in on yourself and it's an important part of shifting believe it or not it's really an essential critical part of shifting out and reframing limiting belief systems okay you have a question um saying how can i know when i'm holding back holding myself back out of fear versus because i know something isn't right for me okay so that's a that's a great question check your facts first So for instance if how do i know if it's not right for me sometimes when you get into fear fear based thinking you're you're not thinking as clearly about the facts so what are the facts like what's the situation what are the pros and cons what are the advantages for you and if we're talking about an entrepreneurial you know a work a work related thing what is it that you're trying to achieve what what are the costs what's the benefits what's the tailwinds what's the headwinds do a critical analysis using your you know facts and then if if you find yourself doing this what if this what if that which a lot of us do and that's another strategy that i teach the what if take it all the way down what if well what if rates go up after i've got the loan then your loan's going to be more expensive does your budget support it what if you know just take them pull the string off the sweater take it all the way down usually at the end of the road it's not as catastrophic as we think we catastrophize things without really going down the line and saying well what if this happens okay well then this what if this happens well then this so that's where your fears might get triggered so follow the the logic 
check your facts, follow the logic. If you're still feeling those feelings, it may just be fear-based thoughts. And that may not be based in anything that's really reality. Does that answer the question? Or is she like, is she giving an, he or she giving an eye roll no, emoji? Uh, no, not yet. Yeah, she says, thanks, Nancy. <laughs> and, and I'm not telling you anything I have not done myself. But believe me, these strategies I've used myself uh, and I use them for a decade or more. Um, so they, they really is remarkable what can happen when you start unpacking your own your own thoughts. Great, awesome. A lot to digest there. Everything from I took so many notes. Um, you guys will all get a brief summary and um, of uh, a little cheat sheet of Nancy's workshop um and i think uh the work the onus is on us now to to do to do the work and and really shift the mindset um so that we see the results of the experience as you say um, right and try try it for you know try this for a, a week or two you know see if you find that you're less automatic and you know reverting to the limiting belief it's different for everybody but um i i i have witnessed the the power of what this change can do, and especially for entrepreneurs, right? There's so much uncertainty. We don't like uncertainty, but when you can reframe it, you you energize yourself to move forward instead of holding yourself back. So, yeah, I mean, like they they say, it, it don't mean to sound cliche, but you know, uh, get comfortable with being uncomfortable and and basically uncertainty, because if if you can't manage that, then uh, then you can't really do much. Uh, okay. Right, and if, uh, if, you're, if you're ready to start a new business, you have the courage to look back at your childhood and see what happened and see, right? See how yeah. you can connect dots, right. Um, we've got a question about imposter syndrome, how to manage and address this. So imposter syndrome is, a, is, is, a, is the poster child for limiting beliefs, right? It's like, who, who, who says I can do this? Well, who, who says you can't? Again, I'm beating the same drum, but I, I beat it for a reason. What are the facts? What have you done up until now? What, you know, we, we're not really good at, at looking back and reviewing our own accomplishments, especially when we're faced with a new thing. And so what is the thought that you're having? Maybe it's that, I don't know what form of imposter syndrome. Maybe you got a call from a potential client and you, you're, you're, you're questioning yourself and you're starting to doubt, well, can I really do this? What have you done so far? What leads you to believe you can't? What are the facts that support your self-doubt? And if there's real facts behind it, well, then what can you do to alleviate that? What, can, what learning can you do? What can you get curious about to empower you to do the thing? But imposter syndrome is this like kind of momentary, like, you know, the, the, the rug gets pulled out from under you. Notice it and then review. Okay. You know, if, if, you're, an, if you're an entrepreneur and you, what's your experience up until now? And what, what, is, what, is, what are the facts that tell you that your imposter syndrome is, is based on reality. It, and, and I don't mean to oversimplify it, but in many ways it's that simple. Because once you get into your thinking brain and out of your anxious brain, a lot can change. Use your wise mind. We don't, we go into anxious mind, you know, all that, all that chatter. Get into your wise mind, look at the facts. What have you done until now? What has, what has uh, given you the experience? have this opportunity. And if it's a more pervasive general imposter syndrome, like, who oh, am I kidding? I can't start a new business. It's, it's like, again, write it on the card and write on the back what you really want to do and say it out loud and keep, keep saying it. Whatever it is that you think you can't do, what is it that you want to do? And then work towards that because you're expending energy. You might as well be expending it to move forward. 
I like that. Absolutely. Um, I hope that answered your question, Yusa. Um, and uh, Nancy, if I could just ask you to um, just stop sharing. I want to just share the last slide. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Great. Um, so if you guys want to connect, Nancy is on Wisley. Uh, you just have to join as a user and you can reach out directly to her. You can do Q&A, as I mentioned, uh, for those of you who weren't there earlier, directly. Uh, you can ask her a question You uh, and uh, set up a one-on-one -on -one with her um, as uh, whatever your uh, whatever you need to do. Um, and uh, please follow us uh, on our social channels to, to, um, to know about more such learning courses. We have two more coming up for the year. Uh, the next one is actually this evening uh, on pricing and how to price right uh, in partnership with Stripe. Um, and then we have one more early December but all our learnings eventually go on our YouTube channel. So we will send out the links now that you guys are on our list. Um, so you have access to them. Um, and if there aren't any other questions, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for joining. I'd like to thank Nancy for sharing so uh, openly and in depth um, with all your years of experience and being a living, breathing example of uh, <laughs> this method. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, and we will see you at the next learning. Thanks, everyone.